Okay. Let's talk about syncope. Let's. Um, so this is a gigantic topic. It and, is. And so syncope technically, I guess, can be neurologic, and it's an altered mental status state officially. So, and we all know that there are a million things that cause syncope. So I'm just going to warn you, like, put on your seatbelt, you know, pour yourself a drink, because this is a lot of stuff on syncope. Now, we did divide it, though, so it's not going to be one gigantic thing like AMS was. This is going to have places where you can stop along the way. We've kind of parsed it up a little bit, so hang in there. So syncope. We have sort of we have syncope in adults and syncope in, in kids, and there's, we know there are lots and lots of causes. And by the way, syncope is one of those complaints that uh, I don't know about you, but I get just this little uh, when I pick up a chart with syncope or I see a, a steep called syncope because most of the time it's nothing, like really nothing. It's those are always the codes you're called to if you get called to something in the hospital, right? Something in their blood drawn, they have syncope. But every once in a while, it can kill them, and that's anywhere between, oh, say, four and thirty percent of the time, depending on the study you have. But enough, like any of those could be something that could kill them. And our job is to sometimes find the needle in the haystack. Sometimes it's really obvious why they had a syncope episode and why it's bad, and sometimes it's not, and you have to be super vigilant. So if you wanted to batch them into categories of why people get syncope in adults, the sort of neurocardiogenic things are the things we see really commonly. This is sort of the vasovagal stuff. I'm getting my blood drawn. I get all sweaty. I pass out. Um, usually these people are upright. Okay, it's something like getting my blood drawn. And these are, it can be anybody. It can be almost all ages. They can have comorbidities or not. So that's why it's great if it's a 20 year old healthy person and who has this, I had my blood drawn, I fainted versus a 75 year old person with a million medical problems. It makes it a little harder. Um, we have situational, I, you know, I was peeing and I fainted, or I had some ep episode that scared me and I fainted, or carotis, I love carotis sinus syndrome. That was one of my favorites, actually. Mm -hmm. I had a patient who diagnosed it for me, I just had to listen. We talked about looking over, like putting his arm on the back of the seat and turning this way to go back up his car. Now you don't have to do that now because you have your little backup cameras, but every time he turned his head to the right, he fainted. It's like, ooh, that's interesting. And mm -hmm. I'll be darned if he didn't have carotid sinus syncope. That was great. Um, the, the st those, none of those really kill you unless you happen to do that and then fall off a building. But it, what's, what's more likely to kill you is something like cardiac syncope. And that's what we worry about all the time. And the, the two big things in cardiac syncope are rhythm issues and obstructive issues. So a valvular problem or an obstructive problem like a hokum that can give you obstruction to outflow or a dysrhythmia. Um, and, and in the outflow obstruction stuff includes things like pulmonary emboli. Somehow in the, in the circulatory system itself that keeps your brain perfused, something blocks it. So bad, bad squeeze can do this, myocardial infarction. Th these are the scary things, right? So you can read the list as well as I can, but they're the things that we really do worry about. The, and if you look at the list, what it gives you is an idea of why we do the things we do on history and on exam in a syncopal person that you just have to ask, some of which aren't things you necessarily ask in everybody you, you talk to. So you have to kind of put that together. We're going to spend a little time on orthostatic syncope. There's a lot of kind of nuance to that that honestly is probably a very little import, import with the exception of falling and breaking your hip if you're older. But otherwise, that, that those are the big categories. And we're looking for those life threats, that anywhere between 4 to 5% to up to 40% of people that might have a life threat as the cause of their syncope. Now, kids are a little different, um, but they have similar concepts here. That they still have some cardiac causes of syncope that can be scary. Structural heart disease in kids. You know, they have the um, uh, VSDs and things where they can have problems. There are neurologic stuff, seizures may be the problem. It's not syncope. That's, we'll talk about seizure and syncope in a little while. Psychogenics in there, uh, other causes. You can read this chart as well as I can. The key is to have a differential diagnosis of things that you think about that will guide your history and your exam because so much of diagnosing syncope is yeah. based on history and exam. Exactly. So it has to be thorough. So look at these lists and think about the kinds of questions you would have to ask to make sure you answer these questions. Like, what were you doing when it happened? Did you have any chest pain when it happened? Were you short of breath when it happened? You know, the, the things that would make sense to pick up on this stuff. Now, here's a diagnostic algorithm to kind of go through it. And I think the thing that's most important about this is to understand that if you look at this, you know, of course, if somebody's super sick, you're going to resuscitate. But you're, if you look at that first box, you know, first one down from the top, it says history, physical, and ECG. And that is 100% true. Your history, your exam, and ECG are going to give you the answer if it's an answerable problem most of the time. Everything else beyond that is just cake. It's just stuff that actually adds sort of icing on the cake. It doesn't really give you that much more. Some of it does, most of it doesn't. You're going to have a really good idea after the history, physical, and ECG, what's wrong with the person. And then you can kind of go through this algorithm. I'll kind of let you lead through it. But the, the key here is to have a really good, consistent, reproducible approach to somebody who might have a syncopal episode. 
Our biggest concern is a cardiac source. So that's our biggest concern. And that's either heart itself rhythm issues or something in the pipe system that causes a perfusion problem. So you're going to ask questions like, has anyone in your family ever died for an unknown reason? Don't say, has anyone in your family ever dropped dead to <laughs> someone who just had a syncopal episode? It's a little scary. Make sure you, you sort of answer it or ask it sort of nicely and empathetically. But you know, have, have there been any, any unexplained deaths in your family? Family history of sudden death isn't something you routinely ask but it sure should be when you're dealing with somebody who has syncope. You're going to want to know, was there a prodrome? Did you have an aura that went with it? Did yeah. you feel lightheaded? Did, you, did the room, the light you know, sort of come in and make a tunnel vision? That's not usually a scary thing. Go down like this is a scary thing. Any palpitations, chest pain, exertion. And that think about it. You're going to ask every person as, as part of your history, what were you doing when it happened? Were you exerting yourself? Were you running around on a football field? Were you walking? What were you doing? Were you having sex? What were you doing exerting yourself? Because could that have been a cause of an obstructive issue here? Um, so that's super important. Listen on your exam. Now, we've all gotten, I think, honestly, a, a little sloppy on our exams. Where we're so comfortable with our tests and ordering our EKGs and ultrasounds at our bedsides, et cetera. We've gotten a little sloppy with our exams. But you're going to listen for things, in particular, murmurs. You're going to listen for murmurs in people. And you're going to listen for particularly stenotic murmurs in folks. You're going to listen for an aortic stenosis murmur, which is that crescendo, decrescendo murmur that radiates up to the, to the carotids. You're going to listen for that. You're going to listen for a hokum murmur in an you know, obstructive cardiomyopathy murmur murmur in a younger person. They will have murmurs that you can do maneuvers to kind of bring them out. We'll talk some more about those. And you're going to look at that EKG. We'll talk about the specifics you're going to look for on this ECG, but you've got to look really carefully and document. I think a lot of people now have dot phrases that are, are you know, if you're an EHR kind of person, you have a dot phrase that will basically populate with all the things you need to look for on an ECG. Ischemia, blocks and pauses, um, evidence of brugada, uh, evidence of prolonged QT, evidence of WPW, dagger Q waves. You know, there's a, there's a whole lit. Uh, a whole list of things that you're looking at. That's most of them. Anything I missed in there? No, that sounds about right. That's um, a pretty good summary. Right, that you need to put basically document yeah. and not just document it. Go look. Actually, look at that EKG and see if they're there. Um, you do need to determine syn syncope from seizure. The, the, I'll tell you the best thing to tell you the difference between syncope and seizure is a postictal state. If somebody went down and then is kind of hard to arouse for a little while, that's probably a seizure. If somebody g like drops and then is kind of awakened with it within 30 to 60 seconds, ooh, that sounds like syncope. Um, and we do know that people who have um, cardiac arrest can have myotonic jerking yes. that looks like seizures. When it's not, it's there out. Yes. Just had this happen on a patient I yep. just took care of. It, was, well, it wasn't even on the monitor yet, but you knew what happened. He did that eyeball thing, that stiffening thing that looked like a seizure, and he, we knew he was in cardiac arrest. So determine syncope from seizure. post is probably the most useful thing, and sure short duration, rapidly responding back is more consistent with syncope. Um, is there a positional change? You're going to ask about that again in your history as well. And then all this other stuff, the psychological stuff, remember, those are always default. You're going to go at, or, you know, by the end of everything. You're going to go through all the other things first. Now, there's a, if you look at the slide, there are well, I don't know how many on this now? S six on this and actually more, I think, out there in the real world. Decision instruments to help us figure out what caused someone's syncope. Again, we're looking for that potential life threat. Who's safe to send home and who needs to have more done? The fact there are six tells you none of them works beautifully. And they don't. The, we're going to go through a couple of them just so that you know. I think if you get a case on, on your exam or a case in real life, the things that are important about these decision instruments are kind of what's in them, not to use them, but what's in them. So the San Francisco syncope rule, which kind of has fallen apart, it just doesn't really work out there enough to rule out the scary stuff. You don't have a really good, this group is safe. But we know people with heart failure history, people who have a low hematocrit where they may have a bleed, people's ECGs look abnormal, who are short of breath or who have a low blood pressure on presentation, of course those are ones we're gonna worry about. And this one just reminds you to make sure you look at those things, pay attention to those things. The Canadian syncope rule is actually panning out to be probably the most useful of all of them. And this has minus points for things that you know are not scary kinds of syncope and plus points for those that are. Um, it could look at, and, this, <laughs> and the Canadians are really good at decision instruments, instruments with rating adverse events, et cetera. Um, this has a very low and low risk group where your numbers are basically zero or less, even less than zero. That group tends to be pretty safe. Again, it's not a be all end all though. Again, just use your smarts. Your gestalt, your gestalt is basically almost as good, if, if not better, than these rules. 
This one is the rose. This one has a BNP in there. I don't think, I don't know anybody who uses this routinely, but BNPs are just something to, if you've ordered them, pay attention. Um, and here's some comparators. And I am not going to go through these because it just tells you the details of these. Here's one that's even more details of these. I think the thing that's important to know is that when there are this many rules, none of them works great. But what got put into these rules are the things that, that got derived as predictors of things that could be bad. And they're the kinds of things you're going to want, you're going to want to add to your H&P. So there you go. There we go. That's the general stuff. We're going to get into specifics. Yeah.